We're talking about the myth that Christians should not judge. Christians should not judge. And the mindset that we have in our society today is a tolerant, filled lifestyle. That everybody should be able to do whatever they want to do and everything in their eyes would be right. But what does the Bible say about the word judging and judging others? You know, when you look at the myth that we should not judge, there's a reason why people feel that the church or the Christians should not judge. The mindset, the mindset that the world has about the church is the mindset of Judge Judy. Anybody ever watch Judge Judy? All the way, I like Judge Judy. Um, Judge Judy was an American icon. Her full name is Judith Shinlin. After she retired as a family court judge in Manhattan in 1996, that's Manhattan, New York, not Manhattan, Kansas, uh, she started a second career of television, abrasive, no-nonsense Judge Judy. On her show, the state of New York flag is behind the bench. But the show is filmed Hollywood. Her courtroom isn't a real courtroom. It's a binding arbitration process in which both parties have signed an agreement that they would abide by her decision. The gallery is made up of actors and are told to discuss the case among themselves. The plaintiffs are real, and they have submitted the claims to the show's producers. It is a disclaimer process. They make $100 a day. They are flown from their hometown to Hollywood, and they get hotels, food, and a per diem. Now, Judge Judy makes $25 million a year. She is known for her Judaisms her sayings, and her hard line of judging. Why do I say that? Because the world sees the church. The world sees Christians as Judge Judy's. They don't see us sometimes as Christ-like followers of Jesus. Let's watch this little clip of Judge Judy. And let us have this mindset that our calling is that we should love people and respect people, but at the same time, we need to call people out, but do it in a way that we are honoring God. In the scripture we just read, it says, sometimes we have a plank or a log in our eye, and we're calling somebody out that has sawdust in their eye. And Jesus very clearly says, get the log out of your own eye before you even communicate to somebody about their sin. And sometimes those that have the biggest sin, have the biggest log, are the biggest critic of somebody that needs the love of Jesus. Judge Judy. Let's watch her clip on Judaism, and let's find out if we rank like she does. Judge Judy. Oh, please. That's baloney. Duh. You look ridiculous. Got it? You ready? I'm ready. You think he's ready? He's not ready. You know who I am, right? That's my name. So, Judy. Who are you, man? How are you doing? Tell me, ask me how I'm doing. Where's my money? The money, I do not owe her anything. Oh, please. She ran out of my house and slammed the door, breaking the window. I was extremely upset, so I grabbed a rock and tossed it gently at her car. <laughs> I'd like 10 million people to hear that you've done something stupid. That's my joy in life. You know what my father used to say? Uh, you want me to grab one out of the air? <laughs> he used to say to me, don't pee on my leg and tell me it's raining. Don't try to teach a pig to sing. It doesn't work and it annoys the pig. Dumb ideas come from people who have dumb brains. No doubt. Did you ever hear the expression, beauty fades, dumb is forever? Either you're playing dumb or it's not an act. <laughs> you see, they don't keep me here because I'm gorgeous and 5'10". <laughs> I am a truth machine, sir. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Don't be a liar. I eat them up for breakfast. You lie to me, I'll wipe up the floor with you worse than anybody else who's ever tackled you. You better tell me the truth because I'm much smarter than you are. I love the truth. Yes, sir. If you don't tell me the truth, you're going to be eating your shoes. The truth? The, no, no, I'm here asking you to lie. <laughs> your story is a crack of baloney. Excuse me? On your best day. 
You're not as smart as I am on my worst day when I'm sleeping. Yes, I have stupid right here. You think you're smarter than I am? Huh? That's not a hard question. Not, no, no. Duh. Uh, you thought this was going to be easy? No, ma'am. It's not going to be easy. Uh, oh, it's not an answer. Well, well it's not an answer. Uh, oh, it's not an answer. Um, um it's not an answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not an answer. Oh, you know that face? That is the guiltiest face I've seen all day. Guilty. Bloody. Ridiculous. You stuff, Miss Doyle, who is a single parent raising three children with bills for your cosmetic dentistry. And you think that I am not going to humiliate you in front of 10 million people? When you lay it out like that, yes, if I am. If your mother didn't lay it out for you like that, I'm going to lay it out for you like that. You speak, I rule, and then you shut up. Do you understand? When I was living in that shed, you know, I was watching the TV and I just happened to see your show. If you like would have watched me more frequently, Dion, you would never be here today. <laughs> You are pretty sick, stupid, outrageous, Allow me. liar, baby, dumb, wise guys. Are you kidding me? Get over it. I don't know what you're talking you about. He cheats all the time. I don't know what you're talking about. Are you trying to justify to me the fact that you're an idiot? This is a case of who's got the most attitude. Who do you think has the most attitude? You did this ridiculous thing. Well, I do. And I believe that you did. Well, I do. Yes, you did. Don't say it again. But I didn't. There's only one person who gets the last word, and that's me. How old are you? 33. He's you look 33, by the way. That's very nice of you. Yeah. It's not going to help you one bit. Aren't you sorry you made a fool of yourself? Yeah. Sit down. Judge Judy. I almost forgot how entertaining this could be. Mm -hmm. I'd like to be honest a few things today. The testimony sometimes of the church and of the Christians is that we are better. That we think we have it together. That if the world would live like us, they would be better. And sometimes the world looks at us as sitting on the bench with a gavel in our hand pronouncing judgment on somebody that doesn't sin the way they sin or we sin, our sin may be different. Our sin sometimes would be pride, arrogance, gossip. The sin makes no difference because sin is what? Sin. Jesus died for all sin. And sometimes just because we've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, we still have sin in our life. And sometimes we as Christians sit on the bench and we have a gavel in our hand and we act like Judge Judy that we are the better ones than you. And if you do what I tell you to do, you'll be better off. And guess what? The standard is not my sin against your sin. The standard is God's word. The standard is we should not judge somebody in a condemning way. But we do have the right to be fruit inspectors upon their life. But do that in a way that is so honest and so transparent. Here's why Jesus said. He was in the Sermon on the Mount. He was talking to other believers. He was talking to his disciples. And he said, guys, listen. I, I need you to judge some things. I need you to find out who's false prophets. I need you to find out who's going to be in the kingdom of God. But here's what you do when you look at somebody's life. You need to make sure your life is okay. You need to see clearly. You need to get the beam that's sometimes stuck in your eye. So you can't see what anybody else is doing. Get rid of the beam in your eye before you tell somebody they should get rid of the sawdust in their eye. And sometimes we have beams in both eyes. And sometimes the arrogance of our life and the arrogance of our church and sometimes the arrogance of just being a Christian, that Jesus loves me more, we have the right to stick our finger in somebody's face and say they are wrong. And sometimes we have the right to do that. But what Jesus was speaking, who Jesus was speaking to on the Sermon of the Mount was other believers. He was speaking to people that already had a relationship with him. And when we talk about what Jesus wanted us to do, he, he uses his humor in that area. He was a carpenter, so he understood woodworking. And he used the sawdust of the mindset that I'm sure as he was cutting wood, he got sawdust in his eyes sometimes and he couldn't see. And he was using that painful experience of the sawdust in his eye. And he was looking at a beam. And he said, sometimes we can't help somebody 
because we have lived a life of hypocrisy. And in that life of hypocrisy, we can't look at somebody with a gentle spirit because we want them to think that we have it all figured out. And sometimes the ones with the biggest beams in their eye are the ones that are the biggest condemning ones of them all. And what we have to do as a believer is what we have to do as a Christian. The Bible says, do not judge or you will be judged. For the same way you judge others will be judged and your measure use of it. It will be measured to you. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank that's in your own eye? Jesus is saying this, you're going to judge. But the same judgment that you pass on somebody will be passed back on you. So if you judge them harshly, it will be judged back on you harshly. He says, don't do that. But the humor that he uses is found in many different cultures. Uh, that's Judaism, but from England, and see if you've heard this meaning, meaning the same thing from England. It's like the pot calling the kettle black. Or Norwegian. The camel can't, oh, Norwegian. Don't throw stones and live in a glass house. Can't do that. Or the Arab people say, the camel cannot see the crookedness of his own neck. Or Germans, one donkey chides another donkey for having long ears. Sometimes we can't see the fault of ourselves because we're so focused on the fault of others. So I want to give you four points about judging and about what judging means and what the Bible says about judging and how we can use the right words when we do judge. Here's the misunderstanding. Who appointed you judge? Well, Jesus did. Jesus did. The do not judge or you will be judged. We will judge others. We judge others every day of our life. We judge things every day of our life. We judge when we pull up to an intersection. Is it clear for me to go? When we hire somebody, we judge. Are they going to be a good fit for what we need to have? When we talk to somebody, are they going to be somebody that's going to elevate me? Or are they going to be somebody that's going to knock me down? We judge all the time. But to understand what Jesus said, the word judge means krino in the Greek. Crino definition, the judge doesn't mean to condemn, it means to evaluate. It means to evaluate. So my job is to evaluate my life and evaluate others around me. When I look at them, when I talk to them, when I communicate to them, if they are, if they are using cuss words every five seconds, you know, it's probably not going to be my best friend, right? If, if they tell dirty jokes all the time, I'm not going to probably hang out with them all the time. So I can evaluate whether I want to be with them or I don't want to be with them. As a teenager, as a youth pastor, I would say we have to evaluate who we're going to hang with because sometimes who we hang with is who we become. So I have to evaluate what I want, who I want to be around, and they have to evaluate whether they want to be around me. Jesus did appoint us to be judges. In Matthew chapter 7, he says this, By their fruits... You will recognize them. Every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. Thus, by their fruits, you will recognize them. That's Jesus saying, you can evaluate who people are. You don't have to judge them condemningly. You can judge them by an evaluation. And he's not talking about a tree. He's talking about people. If a good person has good fruit, you will know that he is a good person. If a person has bad fruit, and that's all he has is bad fruit, you recognize he has a core character problem. And you don't want to be around somebody that has a core character problem because they're going to share that character with you. So the misunderstanding is who am I hanging with and what am I doing? There's an ancient fable about discernment. There once was a lion, and he's the king of the forest. And no longer fast enough to capture his food. So he retired to a cave and pretended to be sick. And he acknowledged all over the land that the lion was sick. And he asked everybody to come in to see him in the cave. So one by one, these animals from the forest came to the cave. And they went to the edge of the cave and they yelled in the cave. And they said, lion, are you here? They said, yes, I'm here. How are you feeling? He said, I'm feeling terrible. Come in and talk to me. So one by one, these animals from the forest would go into the cave. And when went into the cave, the lion would pounce on them and devour them. 
One by one, they would come in, and he would do this day after day after day until a little fox comes up to the cave. And the wiry fox came up to the cave and said, King, lion, are you, are you okay? And he said, he said, I'm very sick. I'm very sick. Come on in and see. And the lion yelled at him, Come on in. Come on in. And the fox stood at the front of the cave, and he looked down. He said, I think I'll be out here. I see many, many tracks going into the cave, but I see no tracks coming out of the cave. And sometimes we have to look at what takes place around us so we don't get caught into a cave being devoured by somebody that wants to trip us up. It is called evaluation, called discernment. Sometimes our judging is actually discernment. What can we do with what God has given to us? So the second is the principle. It's easier to be critical of others than to see our own faults. Isn't that true? And here's the picture that I want to see right here. It is sometimes when we look at the beam in our own eye and we get so caught up in what's in my eye, I try to hide my mistakes, but I try to point out your mistakes. And sometimes everybody sees my life and everybody sees my mistakes, but as long as I can hide them, as long as I can act like they do not exist, I can point out your sin. I can point out your problems. It's easier to see, be critical of others and the faults of our own. The humorous point of the parable is that we can't help someone to speak in their eye a long way. It's, it's hard to see the speck in someone's eye if we have so many problems in our own life. The Message Bible says this in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 7. Don't pick on people Jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. That critical spirit has a way of a boomerang. Sometimes when we have a critical spirit, sometimes we look for somebody's sin, sometimes we try to hurt somebody else, we become very picky, and we become Judge Judy's. And those Judge Judy's, they may be very entertaining, but they're not very good friends, are they? If all they are is condemning you and hurting you and helping you instead of helping you up, See, what the Bible says is you have to look at the, the beam in your own eye before you can help somebody else get the speck out of their own eye. But until we're ready to take the action of taking the beam out, we'll never be able to help somebody else. I heard this funny story of a preacher in the old Southern Baptist Convention way out in the boondocks of Arkansas. Anybody from Arkansas? There you go. These guys are from Arkansas back here. Now, I mean, these guys are way in the boondocks. It's like a monkey run Arkansas, someplace really that there's not even anything there. But uh, everybody tries to get out of Arkansas. But um, there's this preacher. He got up and he was preaching away. And on this topic was on smoking. And he was preaching on smoking. He said, he, he's saying smoking is a sin. And, and it, smoking may not send you to hell, but it's going to smell like you've been there. And, and this little lady said, Amen. Preach it, preacher, preach it. So he got up there and he was pounding on smoking. And he, she was just amen and amen and all over the time. And that was back in the days they walked right outside the door and the preacher was in the back shaking everybody's hand. And he, he got done and the lady got up and she got into her purse. She took out her snuff and she put her snuff in her mouth. So she goes, she walked back there and she started talking to that preacher. They preached that was the best sermon I've ever heard in my life. That was great. And the preacher said, woman, what are you talking about? I'm preaching on smoking. How dare you say I had a good job preaching on smoking when you have snuff in your mouth? She goes, he goes, I can't believe you'd say that. He goes, he goes, it would be a sin to burn something that tastes this good. <laughs> what I'm saying, I thought it was a funny joke. <laughs> what I'm saying is smoking may be a sin for them. And you may say amen to that sin. But what if the preacher hits on your sin? Ooh. Everybody has issues. Everybody has planks in their eye. And what we have to do is understand that I've got to get the plank out of my eye before I say amen to the preacher about preaching on somebody else's sin. Max Lucado, one, a great author, in his book, The Grip of Grace, put an entire chapter on godless judging. And he wrote this. It's one thing to have an opinion. It's quite another to pass a verdict. But is that act more dignified than judging others? There is something smug and self-satisfying about donning the robe, stepping behind the bench, and slamming down the gavel, gavel guilty, standing next to the, all the BTKs, 
Hitler's, Jeffrey Dahmer's of this world, we boast, look, God, compared to them, I'm not too bad. But that's the problem. God doesn't compare us to them. We aren't the standard. God is. And compared to him, there is no one who does anything good. No, not one. And when we judge ourselves, that's exactly what we do. We look down instead of look up. We look at somebody that's worse than us than look at somebody that's better than us. We can get our identity of somebody that we can beat instead of somebody that is superior to us. Judging as evaluating is acceptable, but condemning others is a critical and being a wrong spirit. But the Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 11, Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and the judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it. When we judge the law, we are not keeping it. We never judge them compared to the Bible. We judge them because of our own opinions. When we judge them with our own opinions, we all have different opinions. We all have different mindsets. We have to judge them by the law. What does God say? And how can I love them to what God wants instead of judge them and condemn them so they will never see God? There's a great illustration with this in the Bible. It's found in 2 Samuel chapter uh, 12. Nathan, the prophet, he comes up to David, the king. And he said, David, I need your help. There's been a crime, and I really don't know what to do about this crime. David said, let me hear the crime. I have great discernment. So Nathan went up to him and said, there was two farmers. One farmer had thousands of sheep. Another farm only had one sheep, and they had the sheep as a pet animal. And they loved this sheep, and they stayed with this sheep, and they loved this sheep dearly. But the guests came over to this rich man's house, and the rich man didn't want to sacrifice one of his sheep. So he went over to the poor person's house that only had this one sheep, and he took the sheep from the poor person, and he came over and he slaughtered that sheep to, to feed the guests. David got outraged. He said, what man would do this? He should be punished. He should be killed. But at least he's going to pay four times back of what he stole. And Nathan the prophet stood in front of the king and stuck his finger in his face. And he said, David, you are that man. David was looking at Nathan with planks in both eyes. Adultery and murder. And he was ready to sentence somebody to death for stealing the sheep. But it was David. He took Bathsheba. He took the, the wife of Uriah. And he killed Uriah. And he slept with Bathsheba. And they had a son. And Nathan said, you're the man that sins. But sometimes when we think our sin is hidden, when we think nobody knows about my sin, I can stand up and I can crucify somebody else. But you know what happened to David? He was broken to the point that he fell on his face before God. And he said, oh, I have sinned between you and God. I am wrong. But sometimes we can't see that we have sinned until both eyes are out, get rid of the planks out of both of our eyes. Well, what is the danger? What is the danger? The danger is I'm not a perfect judge because I can't see another person's heart. When we judge others while ignoring our own faults, Jesus says we're a hypocrite. That means that we are playing a part. That means we're acting rather than being real. We can evaluate other people, but we must realize to really truly evaluate somebody, we have to know their heart, and we can't see their heart. We have to see what they did this morning. We have to see what their life went through, what they're going through, the problems that they have. And sometimes we see what they did, but we can't see why they did it. And sometimes we judge wrongly because problems in somebody's life. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, it says, Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We can't judge because we can't see the heart. But God can see the heart. I can judge what you do, but I cannot judge why you do it. I can judge what you say, but I cannot judge why you say it. Only God can do that. Jesus asked a question. He said this, Why 
Why do you have a beam in your own eye and you try to get a speck out of somebody else's eye? Why do you do that? Because it's natural that we do. It's natural that we see somebody with a fault and we're trying to hide our sin or our fault so we try to help somebody else out but we can't even see actually what we're doing. And he says, why do you do that? And it was not a hard question. Why do people do that? And I've got the answer for you. And the answer's tough. And the answer is, I don't know. Have you ever got in trouble with your parents about leaving the ice cream out at night and you forget to put it back in the freezer and the lid's off and the ice cream's all soft and, and your dad gets mad at you and he said, he said, Bruce, why'd you leave the ice cream out? What's my answer? I don't know. That's the answer. My boys did the same thing. They left the ice cream out. And I like Briar's chocolate chip ice cream. Give me an amen on that. And they ruined my Briar's chocolate chip ice cream. And I got up in the morning and my Briar's chocolate chip ice cream was all melted on the counter. Brett, why did you leave the ice cream out? I don't know. It's the answer. How many of you use that answer? I don't know. It is a popular answer. It's an answer that's true, but Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, it says, Sis, this is my heart. The heart is deceitful. Above all things, beyond cure, who can know it? Sometimes we don't know. Sometimes our heart is hard. Only God can judge our hearts. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. And at that time, each will receive his praise from God. It's not ours to judge and it's not ours to condemn. We don't see the heart of men. and We don't know why they have done certain things. But what we must do is we must take the beam out of our own eye and we must help somebody take the speck out of their own eye. It's harder for us Christians it's harder for the church to get rid of the lifestyle that we have, the beam in our eye, because we come across as hypocritical, as arrogant. When the world, what they need is Christians that love Jesus. Christians that love them. Not playing a game, not being fake, not being judgmental as a Judge Judy, but being an evaluator to understand what's taking place. We all have good motives. Sometimes we want to do what's right. But sometimes we come across as somebody that doesn't do what's right. We come across as somebody that's wrong. Why? I don't know why. But sometimes it's because we do not want to be found out. Have you ever misjudged somebody? Have you ever looked at somebody and thought one thing, but once you got to know them, it was something totally different? And when you misjudge somebody and you kind of feel stupid that, you know, really they're, they're a pretty good guy or they've really got it together. Listen to this story. In 1984, a young man died at 16 years of age. At the funeral, the parents request an appointment with the president of Harvard University. His name was Charles Elliott. They expressed their desire to do something in memory of their son. Elliott looked at the modest dressed couple as they decided didn't have much money, and they really, he just wanted to indulge them. The parents said, I, I want to help, I want, I want something to be remembered for my son. Perhaps you could find a partial scholarship, his father said. We were thinking something a little bit more substantial than that, like a building. The patronizing tone, Elliot laughed and replied, that was out of the question, because the buildings are very expensive. The couple left Elliot's office, and they later realized he misjudged the couple. They gave their money to a little college in California. In fact, they gave $26 million in 1884. Anybody have an idea how much money that would be worth today? $716 million in 2017. Of this school, the graduates of the school renamed the memory of their son. And his son's name was Leland Stanford Jr. Stanford University. And sometimes you go to the school of Harvard and everything's wonderful and they look down on you. And people of means, maybe not financial means, 
But people are means, just want to be respected, want to be honored, want to be loved. They were misjudged. And sometimes we judge people unfairly. Sometimes they don't look like us, act like us. And sometimes we judge them inappropriately. And what they need is somebody that's going to take the beam of arrogance and pride out of their eyes and help them take the speck out of their own eye. But church, when we have the beam of sin as Judge Judy in our eye, they're looking at us and they're condemning us. And we have the answer. We have the answer of Jesus Christ that can solve every problem that they have. So we don't need to judge them condemningly. We have to judge them to evaluate. So what is the directive? What is the director? Here's the direct. Keep your eyes clear. So you can see how to help brothers and sisters deal with their struggles. That's why we have to die to ourselves daily. That's why when we have sin within our life, we have to ask God to confess our sins and faithfully forgive us of all of our sins. The main thing Jesus was teaching, not that we shouldn't judge. His primary directive is found in verse 5. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. It's not that you can't judge. He's saying, Christian, I'm calling you to a higher standard. Before you look and condemn somebody else, look at yourself. Look at what you are doing. Look what you need to do. Because when you do what you need to do, then it takes place. See, Jesus was teaching this in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. And he was talking to his believers. He wasn't talking to the, un, to, the, to the ungodly. He was talking to the godly. It doesn't mean that the Christians should not communicate their lifestyle and their faith of others to unbelievers. But it does not mean that we have the right to go to somebody that we do not know and beat them over the head with the Bible and say their sin is sending them to hell before we love them and talk to them about what Jesus Christ can do for us. Sometimes we as Judge Judy gets in their face and we flip the switch off and we lose the right to communicate to them what Jesus Christ has done for them because we condemn them because we're judgmental of them. But what we need to do is love them not, not ignore their sin, not condone their sin, but not condemn them because of sin. Because if it wasn't for Jesus Christ and it wasn't for the person that led you to the Lord, you would be as one of them. But because of the grace of Jesus Christ within our life, we should change their life by giving them what Christ wanted them to do. When my boys were little, I remember the time uh, my youngest one, Bryson, comes running up to me. He's yelling, Daddy, and he had a splinter in his finger. And that splinter was deep. Anybody get splinters? I mean, they, they hurt. They, it was underneath his fingernail. And it was like, ah. Was, I, I looked at that. I said, suck it up, bud. I've had splinters in my fingernail before. You think that's what daddy did? No. Daddy didn't do that. He said, come here. Because I had splinter before, I knew how much pain he was going through. I mean, they hurt. I mean, ah, bad. Just hurt just thinking about it. Um, but what I did is I said, come over here. And we went to the bathroom. We turned on the lights. I put my glasses on, and I wanted to get a clear idea of exactly what I needed to do. Now, I could have said, you can, you can just deal with that. But because I felt the splinter before, and because I wanted to see clearly what I was going to do, and because I didn't want him to have pain, I took him into the light. And I put my glasses on so I could see exactly what I was going to do. And I wanted him to be health, and I wanted him to be safe, and I didn't want him to have pain. And I said, Bryson, this is going to hurt. I said, but it's going to feel so much better after it gets out. So I dug into it, and he was upset. <laughs> but I got, the, I got the tweezers, and he pulled out. And he was, he was shaking a little bit. And you know, five minutes after that splinter was out, he was fine. He could have kept that splinter in his finger and cried about it and hurt about it and yelled about it for a long period of time. Or sometimes you just have to say, suck it up, bud. We're doing this. And we have to be clear-eyed, get into that nail, and pull that splinter out. And once we do that, we'll be healthy. That's exactly what Jesus has called the church to do. With clear eyes, with bright light, not condemning, not condoning, but evaluating. And when somebody comes up to us with a splinter in their life, the pain in their life, he said, guys... I need you to put them under the light. 
I need you to put your glasses on. I need you to be able to see clearly. And I need you to help them become healthy. And when you can do that, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, Brothers, if anyone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore them gently. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. In other words, when it says those who are spiritual, let me tell you what it is. Those that have taken the plank out of their own eye. Those that can see clearly. Doesn't mean you're better than them. It doesn't mean that they are worse than you. It means those who are spiritual. In other words, those who have evaluated their life, and I believe I can help them because I've taken the plank out of my eye, and now I can help them with the sawdust in their eye. And when I can do that, God can take care of me. In another state, this was in Oklahoma. Anybody from Oklahoma? Nah, not so much. Um, in Oklahoma, there was this young lady that went to a revival service. It was a Friday night revival service. And she was invited by some of her other friends. And, and uh, she had a bad night before. She was hungover. And uh, she came to this revival service with her friend. And uh, at the end of the revival service, she came forward. And she gave her life to Christ. And when it came out to who she really was, she came from a very hard life. A lot of drugs, a lot of alcohol, and even prostitution. But she got saved. And the church wrapped their arms around her. And they loved her. And they kind of helped her learn what the Bible says and what they need to do. And, and she, was, she was saved from the bottom of her feet to the top of her head. She was redeemed. She left the life of sin she left the life of alcohol and drugs. And she got wholeheartedly into the church. She started so much into the church that, that uh, she started teaching kids classes. And she loved it and she was transformed and, and she had a new life. And the preacher had a son. And that preacher caught the eye of that woman. And the preacher and the girl started dating. It wasn't too long before, after about a year, that they decided that they wanted to get married. And that's when the vultures came out. You know what a vulture is? A vulture circling around looking for something that they can pounce. Something with stench. Something that they could condemn. And the vultures of the church started getting out and said, the preacher's son is worth more than this former prostitute, this drug addict, this alcoholic. We don't think the preacher's son should marry them. So they had a ladies' meeting at the church. And in this ladies' meeting, these ladies started talking about the preacher's son and this girl. Well, it just so happens that, you know, as preacher's kids, they hang out at the church a lot, and they were in the back, and they started hearing some of the things that these ladies were talking about. And they started bringing up her past, her sin, the things she used to do. They called her all kinds of names. And this girl was crying. She was broken. She was upset. She said, I thought these were my friends. I thought I gave my life to Christ and they kind of helped me and now they're hurting me. These ladies are making fun of me. And the preacher's son comes walking in that back door. Could you imagine how quiet it got? Have you ever walked into somebody that's talking about you? He got quiet. And he goes, ladies, you are absolutely right. My fiancé was on drugs. My fiancé was an alcoholic. My fiancé did sleep around. But she is not what's in question. Can I tell you what you're questioning? You're questioning the very blood of Jesus. Either Jesus saved all of her or Jesus saved none of her. Either Jesus saved you or he did not save you at all. And he said this, I will take the character and the love of a former sinner 
that is saved by the blood of Jesus Christ than you vultures that act like you're Christians but end up being hypocrites. It got deathly quiet. And the leader of their women's group stood up and said, Sir, you're right. We are wrong. We believe the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses all sin. And we are guilty of gossip, slander. She is saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. The young man walked out, took his fiancée, and never went back into his dad's church again. That's Judge Judy. Sometimes we as a church need to understand that we have the greatest power and the greatest force upon the planet. And that's the church. That's the power of Christ. And that's the forgiveness that Jesus Christ offers. We have to remember what it's like to be the one that's judged. We have to remember what it's like to be the one that's hurting. We have to remember what it's like to need somebody to give to us hope and the answer of Jesus Christ. We have to realize that we have to take the plank out of our own eye. And then church, what we get to do is we get to restore those that have specks in their eyes. But Jesus is very strong. He said, Quit being a hypocrite. Quit playing the game. Quit acting like you have no problems. Deal with your stuff. And after you deal with your stuff, then you can help them see clearly. Do we judge? Yes. But not in a condemning way. We judge by evaluation. We judge every day and we judge every person. But when we judge, when we evaluate, let's evaluate from the standpoint of mercy, of love, and grace. Let us judge from the point of what can I do to help you? What can I do to lift you up? What can I do to get you out? What can I do to minister to you? Not as Judge Judy that slams her gavel down and says, get out. No, Christians, let's slam our gavel down and say, come in. Let's love. Let's judge through the spirit and the heart of Christ. And when we can do that, we can throw this myth out the door. Because Christians do judge. We do evaluate. But we do evaluate for the right reason. Not to hurt them, but to love them. To help them. To encourage them. We're not any different than them. Except for we as Christians have accepted Jesus. And the forgiveness that he has offered to us. That is the playing field. Because one day we will stand before God. I don't want to goof that up. Because when we stand before God. God is the standard. I can't get to heaven because of my own. I can't get to heaven because of what I've done. I can't get him because I'm a preacher and I pastor you. That's not going to get me to heaven. The same way that I get to heaven is the exact same way you get to heaven. And it's not because of how much good you do. It's not even as bad as you were. You're going to get to heaven the same way I get to heaven because I stand before God and I say I'm a son of God. I'm a child of the Most High. There was one day in my life that I was a sinner and I was destined for hell. But I accepted Jesus. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleansed me from my feet to my head. I do not deserve heaven, but Jesus saved me. I'm adopted in his family. So by the name of Jesus, I get heaven. No other reason. None. I can't do anything bad not to go to heaven. I can't do anything more for me, God, to put me to heaven. I'm going to heaven not because of Bruce Thomas. I'm going to heaven because of my Lord Jesus Christ. Let us take the plank out of our eye so we can help those sinners take the sawdust out of their eye and let them see Jesus and see Jesus high and lift it up.